So I just wanted to present a patient that I saw in Neuro Ophthalmology Clinic. Um, it, it's a uh, syndrome that we don't see very often, and uh, we got a pretty good video of it. So it, it'll be something that, that uh, hopefully people can take a look at and remember uh, in case they see it in the future. So this was a 74-year-old female who presented with ophthalopsia. Um, <coughs> In July of 2010, she experienced 10 minutes of slurred speech and left-sided weakness and went to the Intermountain Emergency Room and was found to have right vertebral stenosis. Uh, at that time, they attempted to stent that and during or slightly after the stenting procedure, she had a major stroke uh, of the basilar artery and was left with a dense left hemiplegia. She also experienced some intermittent atopia over the following weeks and had a repeat stenting procedure that improved and eventually resolved her diplopia. However, then beginning in September, so now two months later, uh, she began having ophthalopsia where she had difficulty focusing, dizziness and vertigo, difficulty uh, walking in addition to her left hemiplegia but no nausea or vomiting associated. Um, past medical history uh, included hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and atrial fibrillation, all risk factors for the stroke that she had. Um, <coughs> when we saw her, she was on Coumadin, uh, lorazepam, and uh, Toprol, which is a On physical exam, she was 2060 and 2040 uh, with no improvement on, a pin on pinhole. She had no APD. Uh, visual fields, color, and stereo were roughly normal with a moderate decrease in stereo vision like you would expect. Her extraocular motions, she had a full range, but she had a continuous pendular horizontal nystagmus, which also included some torsional and vertical components at times and square wave jerks, but she had no uh, diplopia, no phoria, no trochia. Um, on exam, she also had a rhythmic twitching of both eyelids, the left side of her face and the left side of her neck, and uh, mild to moderate cataracts in both eyes. Her fundus exam was normal. So this is her eye movements and some video of other salient features that occur. Do note that the eyelids are also twitching bilaterally. And this, of course, is the view of her inside her mouth. You can also see the left side of her face is twitching. resident want to say what that is? Thanks, Grant. So, you know, sometimes as residents we uh, don't look below the eye, but uh, looking at her palate and the lower portion of her face um, really help clinch the diagnosis. Uh, certainly, something that we don't see very often, but uh, something which is pretty obvious when you see it. So oculopalatal myoclonus uh, is rhythmic oscillations of the eyes and palate. It occurs not immediately after the injury, but sometime after, uh, roughly two to 48 months um, in the papers and case reports that I read. It can occur after stroke which would be more common, but it can also occur after trauma. 
So this lady, hers was after a stroke, and it started roughly two months after the original insult. The it's a relatively slow frequency of movement in the range of two to four hertz. It can be either unilateral or bilateral, and the bilateral uh, is more commonly a pendular mo motion, like in this patient, and the unilateral often has uh, more of a rotary component. Um, and on MRI, uh, in most of the case reports, I saw the patients e exhibited an inferior olivary enlargement, which also was not evident on the original scans after their stroke or trauma, but occurred roughly two to four years, or two months to four years after the original insult, about the same timing as the uh, ocular palate myoclonus. It's not clear what causes this. Um, some papers I read thought that it related to abnormal discharge uh, from the Purkinje cells in the flocculus. Um, and in different papers, I also read that, uh, that the original lesion may be in the ipsilateral dentate nucleus, ipsilateral superior cerebellar peduncle, or the contralateral central tegmental tract. So treatment actually turns out to be pretty difficult. Um, most of the papers and case reports I read, they tried various things with various levels of success. Um, possible treatments I encountered were baclofen, carbamazepine, clonazepam, gabapentin, diazepam, sodium valproate, and memantine. This patient in particular had been on baclofen without success and was currently on lorazepam. They had started Neurontin after seeing us, and as the dose was ramped up, they experienced increasing dizziness without resolution of their symptoms. So um, in terms of their last note in the, uh, in the rehab clinic, they still had not found a uh, medical solution to her oculopalatal myoclonus. Uh, some people have tried Botox and or surgery uh, including resecting muscles and attaching them to the periosteum or um, large recessions of both inferior and superior rectus uh, in which one case report reported some success with dampening the vertical oscillations in a, in a patient. But of course there would be risks with um, muscles, large muscle surgeries like that as well. In her, I, I can't think of what you would Botox, because she has rotary, vertical, and horizontal yeah, movement. She, she was trying to take the normal gait and the gait was so low that it was kind of like painful. And then she was trying to make sure that the normal gait was good. So she asked one of the doctors, you know, is she allowed to use normal and the other said, you know, you can use it. So after that, she was trying to take it to a normal gait. Yeah. I think it's. I, I, right, that's right. Recession. That's what I meant.
usually, although in some of the case reports, they found medications for certain patients, like some of the medications listed here, that seem to dampen it or merely remove it. So it, it, it varied for every patient in the case reports I read. Some had m no improvement, some had modest improvement, and some had actually significant improvement. All right, uh, Dave Gamil.